150 years ago, in 1870, on the 8th of October, uh, Louis Vienne was born. He's not a mainstream composer. You're unlikely to find him in classical concerts of the proms, for example. But for organ music, um, he's one of the most important composers. He took the symphonic style, which began with the Grand Piece Symphonique um, by Franck, and that was further developed by Vidor, and Vienne continued this style until it reached its peak, which, to all intents and purposes, is very chromatic. Right from the beginning of uh, Symphony No. 1, even though he's a young man, you can hear this chromaticism in the prelude developing. But if you contrast that with the last symphony, number six, um, if we take the scherzo, for example, uh, which is supposed to represent uh, the, the gargoyles of Notre Dame, um, there's, a, there's a huge amount of chromaticism, and this just carries on, and it's very dense and quite difficult to, to follow to begin with. For 37 years, Louis Vienne was always of Notre Dame, and he knew the colours of that instrument. But he was also a travelled organist and, and played a lot in America, and he, he did enjoy playing the Aeolian Skinner instruments particularly uh, because of their colour and versatility. And in fact, I think he liked that so much that when he went and wanted the organ rebuild at Notre Dame, he wanted to incorporate some of that. Um, so it, it's not so strange that we should do these symphonies here at Temple Church, London, because this organ has an abundance of colour. Um, and whilst we wouldn't necessarily play the music exactly as he's printed in his registrations, we know that Vienne actually didn't apply those registrations either. Working through these six symphonies, it seems to be a journey of his life. Um, he was an unlucky man and he had a lot of tragedy in his life, but he was also a very positive, hopeful man. And all these elements are in the symphonies. Um, there is despair and tragedy, of course, but you take the uh, sketch of number two, for example, it's full of joy and apparently he said that if the audience doesn't laugh at the end of it, then we haven't got it right. So he did have a sense of humour. Um, so for me, playing these pieces has just been like living alongside him through his trials and tribulations and his joys and his hopes. The quieter movements actually are, are really beautiful. The romance at number four for me um, is particularly fine. Um, it's, it's very dreamy, it has this long melody. Um, <laughs> and the, the, slow, the adagio of number three, I believe Vienne particularly liked and commented after a student had played it how good he thought the, the piece was. Not the performance, but his piece.
the third symphony of Louis Vienne is the most regularly played simply because it's it's the shortest but it does have some of the most beautiful music in it so if you take the slow movements so there's the cantilane which has the most uh, beautiful singing melody with the right hand accompanied by well, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like a Schubert song with a, with a flowing left hand accompaniment which could be the piano and the soloist singing the tune in the right hand um, and his harmonic journey takes little twists and turns, so you can never quite see where he's going. But every turn he takes sort of kind of like takes your breath away a bit. Working on the Vienne symphonies for this project has been an extraordinary journey. The music is very complicated. It's a universe of double flats and double sharps. Um, it's a universe of chromaticism, quite difficult to read, quite difficult to play. And also for the audience, it's a journey and you've got to invest in this, but it's so exciting. And this music I think will last because of its greatness and it's been an absolute joy to be part of this, uh, this journey. Mm -hmm.